a couple more photos and he's going to get a boner every time his phone goes off. Are you talking about the research done by the Pavlov himself? Conditioned reflexes, an investigation of the physiological activity of the cerebral cortex? Yes, I am. That's the one. Using scientific research and our own personal stories, we are going to form a, a dating, dating hypothesis. hypothesis. In conclusion, it's biology. It's presumptive. It's hypothetical. It's interpretive. Hey everyone, my name is Kayla. And this is Rachel with Dating Hypothesis. Thank you so much for joining us today. This episode is our guide to manipulating a partner into loving you. This is our guide to teach you how to get real love. Tricks to make people addicted to you. They're just habits loving people engage in. Either way, it's based on scientific research. Want love? Pavlov's Bell. Conditioning someone. Train them to think, feel, and be what you want. Assuming you want a partner devoted to you in a solid, committed relationship, you can apply these techniques despite being toxic. They're the same techniques people with personality disorders use in the beginning, but can't keep them up long term because, well... Well, because we have personality disorders and because we don't understand interpersonal healthy relationship dynamics. We do these techniques out of whack, on steroids, and to an extreme until it's labeled love bombing. Maybe these are tricks. Maybe they are normal healthy habits regular people use in their daily life. Maybe it is manipulation. That all depends on you, your intent. What social skills do you currently possess? And how much effort did these techniques take? Given your upbringing and if you had positive role models in your life, these techniques will either be really easy or impossible. The only way we can teach sleazy, swarmy people these tricks is if you are a sleazy, swarmy person. You have a choice. Use these techniques to be a selfish dick or to be a loving partner. Do you have zero intent of keeping up the positive interactions we're about to teach you? If you have a personality disorder and are just an asshole, a narcissist, have low self-esteem, or had zero positive role models growing up, these techniques are probably techniques you've used to your advantage. How are these same techniques used by healthy people? They use them for their partner's advantage, i.e. they give them freely just to make the other person happy. And they continue to give freely over a very long period of time, like 20 years. It's up to you whether you turn these techniques into a lifelong positive streak or if you give up and choose to be self-absorbed. If you are a sleazebag douche fucker, healthy people will pick up on that the very second you slip up. If you're broken, a damaged person like me, and a narcissist uses these techniques on you, you're going to fall for these techniques and pine away for what you thought was real for years on end, never getting the clue when you know full well you were duped. If you are an abusive user hoping to gather new techniques for an easy lay, we don't have anything new for you here today. Just the same shit humans have been telling each other for thousands of years, which is why we suggest a lifelong shift in a positive direction with these techniques. It is not a diet to get you laid quickly. It is a life focus. Technique one, take your time. It's not a race, just like most girls will take around 20 to 30 minutes of foreplay to make her orgasm. There is an equally important buildup to conditioning someone. Read any published research on classical conditioning to understand the timeline, time commitment needed. They call it a timeline for a reason. It takes time, devotion, commitment, and energy. There are no fast passes to training a dog, mouse, or a partner. The three stages of classical conditioning are before acquisition, acquisition, and after acquisition. 
So how long does it take to condition a person, Kayla? According to a 2009 study published in the European Journal of Social Psychology, it takes 18 to 254 days for a person to form a new habit. The study also concluded that, on average, it takes 66 days for a new behavior to become automatic. So whether you are focused on changing yourself with these techniques or just getting someone to love you, it could take a year or it could happen in two weeks. Damn humans, so diverse. <laughs> Why practice the techniques in this episode? Practice develops habits, and when it is your habit to engage in behaviors that cause a person to really like you, then you can only benefit from your new habits. Eventually, you will need to learn how to connect emotionally with people and pursue them naturally. Or if you practice these techniques long enough until it becomes your inner nature, then maybe you learned how to connect emotionally without realizing it. Technique two, do something pleasant. Do it on a set schedule so they look forward to you. It needs to be done often enough that they equate it with you. Once a week is definitely not going to condition someone. Daily is best and at the same set hour, like clockwork. Like what? Like a text. Text is easiest. Phone calls go deeper to the cellular level because it includes your voice. True. Phone calls establish a more intimate bond. This is going to depend on you and their levels of introvert versus extrovertness. I don't recommend purely texting unless you're both deathly introverted and shy. The more normal you are, the more you're going to want to use phone calls. My husband calls me every day during the week around lunchtime. We chat about our day and what is happening tonight, plus we figure out what dinner will be. I don't necessarily look forward to it or think about it unless he doesn't call. Or if he calls later than usual, because then I get anxiety about if he's okay or if something happened to him at work. I think the phone call is important to our relationship because it keeps us connected and on the same page. We actually know what's going on in the other person's day that day. It's a slow start with a text a day, a phone call every few days, ramping up slowly over time as the relationship progresses normally. The more time that goes by, the more you contact them until you've established a good mix of three phone contacts per day. What is a good mix? A good morning text, either a text or short quick phone call on your lunch break, a good night text, or a longer phone call before bedtime. When my husband and I first got together, we started sending each other sweet little X's and O's throughout the day. And you know what? We still do. Knowing he thinks about me during the day actually makes me feel really important and loved by him. I need that connection. I need the love throughout the day, not just a good morning kiss and a good night kiss, right? As time goes by, some people push for more phone time. How do you navigate that if you are not someone who likes to be bugged all day? How do you establish these boundaries? Communication. Exactly. Use communication to communicate that you don't like to communicate. Basically, make sure you let them know firmly exactly what phone time you are willing to commit to. Don't make them beg for that. That doesn't condition anyone. That will piss her off and make her dry up. Eagerly give her the phone time that you both agreed to. The truth is, getting phone notifications give you a mini high that is similar to your brain on cocaine. Your brain releases dopamine and other feel-good chemicals, reinforcing the notification with a feeling of being loved by someone. Cell phone addiction, also known as nomophobia. Nomophobia. Is that like because nomophone, you missing out? Some of these terms are so ridiculous. Nomophobia is the fear of being without your phone. And as someone who loves her phone, that's me, this phobia is real. All of our app notifications keep us addicted to our phones. This bitch right here checks every goddamn notification and most of them are spam emails, goddammit. It's pretty easy to understand someone being even more dependent on their phone if they are equating it to their source of love. If they know you text every day at noon, then when noon rolls around, their body will panic if they can't find their phone. Cell phone use mirrors addictions. It's not formally recognized as a clinical diagnosis yet. In today's society, we cannot function without a phone. Everything we need is in our phone. Is that addiction or is it necessity? 
I mean, that depends. Can you function? Can you have your phone on you and still do your job, homework, interact with your children, spouse? Or are you glued to it because it is literally more interesting than living your own life? Are you slacking at work to be on your phone? Are your grades slipping? Is your future being tended to? Or are you neglecting everything in your life so you can interact with online stimuli or people that are not growing your personal circle of health? I have a flip phone. I don't have internet for it. It just calls and texts and I have the setting chosen to refuse images in the texting boxes. Every morning I drop it in my backpack. I lose it for a couple of days and tend to check messages about once a week unless I'm actively in a relationship with someone that I like. Usually I'm in a relationship with people I don't like, which is why I enjoy losing my phone. I think the only thing I'm addicted to online is Reddit. When I open that shit, nine hours will pass without me even noticing. The only thing that clues me into time passing is having to pee. And I kid you not, I will sit there glued to that damn computer reading Reddit posts for an hour after I've registered that I have to pee really, really bad. Like I could bring the damn laptop to the toilet with me, but but no, I sit there clicking and reading like a junkie. <laughs> Neuroimaging has shown parallels between smartphone addiction and other addictions. So the point of all this is to say that phone addiction is real. Slide into that niche and let your love interest be addicted to you through their phone. Be the notification that comes in every day at noon. And what happens if you're inconsistent? Say you establish this bond for a few weeks and then stop. Let's look at a cow's udders as a metaphor. I can connect with this as a mom who nursed two babies. Let me tell you, missing a pumping session is the worst pain I've ever felt. Cow's milk comes in at 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. You've worked hard to make the udders ready at 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Cows do really well with routine. Going too long between milkings should not happen. If a cow is neglected, her udders will get too full, causing bruising, infection, and if it continues to be ignored or neglected, could result in death, death of your relationship. There is a standard of care that is given to dairy cows. Do not neglect or ignore an established routine. Pavlov's dog salivated to the ringing of a bell. Pavlov rang the bell, then fed the dogs. Repeatedly pairing the food and bell established a conditioned response. Eventually, Pavlov could ring the bell and the dog would salivate. Men love porn and nudie photos. So, if you pair your nudes with his phone notification, that man gonna salivate. This technique will never lead to love from a man but it will addict him to your nudes. We all know when it's time to get off work, even when we're not looking at the clock. That anticipation is real. Circadian rhythm is a physical, mental, and behavioral change that follows a 24-hour cycle. This natural process uses light and dark to time biological effects. Most living creatures use circadian rhythms, including animals, plants, microbes, and fungi. We are no different. Time, set times, and being on time is something our body is attuned to. When I am at work, I can feel the day dragging on, and my body knows exactly when the day is almost over. The phone call from my hubby adds some relief. His voice is my favorite to hear over the phone. Chronobiology is the study of circadian rhythms. We all have this biological clock. Nearly every tissue and organ in your body uses it. Researchers have identified the gene behind our clock's molecular components. All of these little cellular clocks have a single master clock in your brain. Your brain coordinates all the little biological clocks, keeping them in sync. The part of your brain that does this is a little group of neurons called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The suprachiasmatic nucleus gets its instructions from the eyes or from light detection. Addicting someone to you should only take a few weeks of consistency. The hour before said interaction, they will have a biochemical reaction anticipating you on an unconscious level. Do it right and they will be sad on the days it doesn't happen. Be consistent until they are hooked or they won't reach out when you pull back to test if they respond to your absence. I used to work at a Renaissance festival and there was a specific stage actor that would walk by our booth at the exact same time every Saturday and Sunday. He had a sunny disposition. He was super friendly to everyone as he passed. I got the hugest crush on this guy, but it was a weird crush because I had a good reason to not like him. 
I did not like this guy. But the entire eight weeks this conditioning was taking place, I knew I was being Pavloved. This guy had no idea the effect he was having on me. But I seriously looked forward to him walking by every day. He was so cheerful. When I would run into him later, like during the week when I was out and about, my body would physically respond to seeing him with this crushing, blushing gush of hormonal goo that would really piss me off because I didn't like him. Technique three, map yourself into their mind. In episode three, we detailed brain mapping. Brain mapping is a result of the outside world getting mapped onto our brains. Let's do a thought experiment. Simplify the world around you into pixels. Each pixel of light, sound, taste, touch, and scent is directed to your brain along its own nerve, to its own neuron, creating a map in your brain of the world. You are pixels of sight, sound, taste, touch, and scent, which means you can be mapped onto another person's brain. Why is it so painful to break up with someone after you've dated for years? The neuronal pathways in your head that were formed around that person for years no longer have their voice activating them, no longer have that scent, that specific touch. The taste of that person is gone. Your brain is rewiring. The map in your brain of that person is useless. It's no longer being activated. Your brain has to prune away at those deserted paths. So how do you, as the interested party, get yourself mapped into their brain? A full brain takeover results from a factor of complex interactions. Five to be precise. Your five senses? Your five senses. Sing and whisper your way into their brain. I have an ex that gave me mixtapes and introduced me to songs I still like. And when I hear those songs, I think about them. I don't want to, but it's ingrained. I had a few boyfriends that hated to talk in general. Their voices never got imprinted into my mind, while other boyfriends who are chatterboxes during the day and vocal with me during sex get really deep into my psyche. I crave the sound of their voice, and if I don't hear it for a day or two, it makes me sad. Hell, I think I'm Pavloved by you, Kayla. If a week goes by and I don't video chat with you, I get fucking depressed for real at this point. We all know scent is tied to memory. Wear the same scent, including shampoo, soap, toothpaste, laundry detergent, so they relate the scent to thoughts of you. Be associated with the smell of certain foods. When they smell a certain food, let that food remind them of a super fun cooking night you shared together or a favorite meal. Fart, burp, and B.O. your way into their brain. The more shy a guy is with me, the more difficult it is to relax with him and be myself. Your comment about farting and burping is gross, but true. When you are fully integrated into someone's life, it's okay to have bodily functions. I can't imagine being in a relationship that is standoffish and people are afraid to take a shit in their own house for fear their spouse will smell it. My husband was making some nasty farts last night. Good Lord, but he ain't shy about it. The more you put yourself into someone's brain, the more okay everything you do is, including bodily functions. Is there a certain touch your hubby does like? like hold a certain part or a certain way or specific cuddles like what does how does he hold you how does he touch you because every guy I've been with has had particular ways of touching or holding me if we're comfortable with each other like they all have their own way of nestling in one guy would rub my ear like a banky and smell my neck if we fell asleep I still miss that my hubby, he holds on to right where the top of my muffin top would be. Is that a good way to describe it, right? It's uh-huh. a perfect little handle for his hands when we fall asleep. He like lands right there. And not going to lie, it's super comforting until I'm getting super tired. And then I'm like, stop touching me. I need my own little bubble. But seriously, have a specific touch you give that maps you onto their brain. You don't have to agonize over finding the perfect touch to use. Just find what feels really good between the two of you and own it. Make it your thing. The more you touch them, the larger space you take up in their sensory cortex, an area of the brain that processes information about touch and other senses. Every spot on their body has a location in their brain. Make a point of touching every inch of their body to touch every inch of their brain. And I'm not talking just dry touch, not just the boring touch. 
kiss, lick, slurp, slobber, nibble, bite, scratch, pinch, pet, pull, push, prod, drum, beat, tippity, tap, tap, tap. What can I say except you're welcome. Your way onto their brain. Build memories of taste. One of my husbands loved taking me out to sushi. One day we were talking about the best sushi restaurants, the freshest fish, and how good it tastes. He admitted one of the reasons he specifically likes salmon was it reminded him of eating out a girl. But the salmon had to be fresh for the texture to be right. To this day, when I get the perfect sushi, I think of him every time. Put taste in their brain and associate it with your face, your voice, your touch. Mix and match all of these senses to burrow deep into their survival neurons. Sight takes up a large portion of our brains. You can be seen in real life, live in person. You can send them photographs on their phones. You can print a photo of the two of you and put it in their house on the wall, mirror, or bedstand. Do video calls with them instead of always texting. Give them your shirt or hoodie. Why? It's a visual scent and touch mixture that us girls just die for. It's the same thing as wrapping them up in a warm hug all day that smells just like you. I was rummaging through a bunch of old boxes in my basement and I came across an old sweatshirt of my ex's. It flooded me with memories. Some good, some bad, but it was pretty strong. Pulling that out of the box after all these years? Is the person you're wooing demapping someone else? This is why healthy people take time after a breakup. Are they demapping their ex? That takes time. It takes time to map someone in and out of your brain. Does the person you are wooing have a current map of someone else or many somebody else's? Is their brain full? Full of maps of other people's scent, taste, touch, or sounds? If you are mapping yourself onto five neurons in their brain, that is five paths. If you and three other people are all mapping onto those five or creating 20 new pathways in a brain, that gets a bit jumbled and busy. And if you don't stick around long enough to map anything, that might explain your feelings of detachment. It all depends on your level of comfort of having someone else take over your mind. Maybe you feel like a parasite is taking over your thoughts if you get too close to someone. Maybe you're like me and feel alone in an echo chamber of hell if no one's mapped into your brain. A person's chemical mixture might be balanced or imbalanced like their brain chemistry. So many glands in our body make hormones. If any of these are off, like the pituitary, thyroid, adrenal, penile, ovaries, or testes, we are no longer a dignified human being. We're just a hormonal mess. Genetics, your upbringing, and relationships in your life being role modeled all factor into how you will behave towards someone. Despite all of that, you can control your own behavior. You can tailor your actions to get what you want. Abuse survivors are predisposed to abuse, so tricking them into loving you is much easier than tricking healthy people. That will also make you a predator. But either way, humans like attention. They want love. And we are social creatures. All humans want genuine love. No one wants to be tricked or manipulated. Unless you keep the ruse up for life. Because at that point, what is the difference? Let's take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. And we're back. Technique four. It's not karmically correct to make someone fall in love with you if you don't have feelings for them. Certainly not ethically correct to build something stronger in them than you feel for them. If you are going to addict someone to you, make sure you have time for them. Do you need therapy instead of a girlfriend? Maybe it's better to spend this time and energy healing your inner trauma so you don't feel the need to manipulate someone. Are you ready to be healthy and need this list of healthy behaviors to follow until you have formed healthy habits? Technique 5. Test to see if the eagle has landed. Once you are solidified in their system, test to see if they are yours. Back off a bit to see if they reach out. If they do, you're in. 
don't back off regularly, too often, or suddenly. This is just a test to see how they respond to the lack of you. It's not abandon ship and traumatize them with lifelong abandonment issues. Behaving like a jerk builds resentment. Some people intuitively know to do the tests. Every time a friend of mine would date a new girl, he would back off a month into it just to check and see if it's worth a new relationship. Well, my female best friend never checked. She was always right there, never backed away. A year will go by and she will realize the guy never initiates anything, ever. She could have checked on that in the beginning instead of wasting an entire year with him. After you have established yourself in their brain, switch to intermittent. It's okay to slow it down, ease off a little. No one can keep up the wooing behavior forever. It's called the honeymoon phase for a reason. But if you go from honeymoon to, thank God we're in a relationship now so I can ignore you and make you do all the work, you're doing it wrong. If they don't realize you've disappeared, you might be barking up the wrong tree. If they never initiate contact, don't miss you or notice you're gone, or they make you plan all the weekends, holidays, and meals, you might think about giving your time and effort to someone else capable of reciprocating. It is a long, lonely road to be in a relationship where you are the only one putting in effort. Just because you are healthy now doesn't mean that they are. Technique six. You figured out what they need, now stick to it. Are they a hermit? Are they a socialite? Let them know how often you need them. Your needs need to be met tell them what you need. If your needs are too much, make sure you don't smother them. Compromise. If you still need more, is it because of your personality or because of their personality? Are you in love with the right person? It's okay to date people until you realize they're a bad fit and then dump them. It's called dating. It's the very definition of dating. If they're not the right fit, dump them. Do you just need to make a friend who's available to take on your extra burdensome needs? Don't forget to balance. Just because they love you or you love them doesn't mean they have to fulfill every need you have. There are a lot of people in the world. You can have a partner, friends, family, coworkers, hobby partners, church acquaintances, and still need to meet random people while camping, hiking, or on vacation. The brain map we talk about needs stimulation. When it gets too stagnant, it gets depressed. I'm not saying life has to be crazy and full of nonstop adventure. Technique seven, be predictable. Why? It feels safe, secure, and builds trust. Predictability is a must to an extent. If you are so predictable that you are boring, that is a problem. If you are so unpredictable that you are unattainable, then that is counterproductive. The cheaters that get away with it for 20 years and their spouses have no clue are skilled enough to maintain a schedule that their wives trust. If you are going to have a life away from your partner, you need to establish it right away and stay consistent. Before you go into a relationship, you need to understand that as more time goes by, you will be required to put in more time. So plan that from day one. Be aware of the incremental growth pattern of healthy relationships so you are not surprised or put out by her needing more time. There is a natural progression to the thing we call relationship that is normal and expected. Go into it knowing that and be prepared for it. One guy I dated had zero clue how relationships progressed naturally. We floundered around like a couple of fish out of water and when I would bring up the next step, he looked at me like a deer in the headlights. A few weeks would go by, he would process that information, and then he would agree it was the next logical step. I got so sick and tired of teaching him about American human dating customs. I swear that man was a freaking alien. <laughs> My most recent ex pretends he doesn't understand conventions surrounding dating. He waits for the girl to pick out an apartment for them, and he moves in with her. He refuses to talk about it, help look for the apartment, or even acknowledge that it's happening. He wants her to do all the work of pushing them forward so he can say it wasn't his idea in an argument and that she put herself in this predicament. 
If you're a player and you get into a relationship with a girl while you have a side hoe and things go sour with the side piece, don't start spending that time with your girl because it's suspicious and strange that all of a sudden you have that time. And then when you find a new side hoe and you have to disappear again, making it 10 times more suspicious. If your side hoe is a seasonal sport like tennis or fishing, build that time away right away. Just never give her that time. It's non-negotiable year round. No one likes a roller coaster and girls who want to keep that time if you give it to them even for half a year, you ain't getting that shit back. My hubby and I have hunting time built into our relationship. We've known this from the start. We both like to hunt and we're both going to disappear a few weekends annually. And the other person is just going to have to plan to be there with the kids, the pets, and the house for a few days. Non-negotiable. Technique eight, be available. Playing hard to get is a dick move. It feels arrogant and cold. Who wants to be in a relationship that is supposed to be supportive and loving with an aloof ass? If you are going to be in a relationship, devote a large chunk of your time to your partner, depending on their needs, of course. After you've established and carved out your time, then stick to it. Don't make them beg for your time and attention. If that's your tactic... It's unhealthy and it creates a sick environment for both of you. If you don't like spending time with your partner, what are you doing with them? And if you need vast amounts of time and space in relationships, be clear about that up front. Once she has a key to your apartment or you both move in together, if you need your own space, you can find a way. Grown adults with decent jobs can afford college rooms for rent. You can have a desk, bed, TV, and access to a shower. There was one guy a while back that I was cheating with. He was super surprised when I rented us a garage in an apartment complex. I decked it out with a bed, rug, lamp. He was more than happy to split the $100 a month with me. There wasn't a bathroom, but we only met for an hour a few times a week. Of course you did. Today's episode is about healthy relationships, though. If you are super introverted, shy, and want to play video games by yourself without looking like a loser to your girlfriend, it's okay to rent something for yourself. You get to spend your money the way you need in order to keep your own sanity. I dated a guy who manipulated his girlfriend into taking a yoga class so he could cheat on her every week at the same time. Oh my god, Rachel. That's not dating a guy. How do you define which one is the girlfriend? The girl who ends up with more time per week with him or the one living with him? I mean, I feel bad for them because their finances were all tangled up in that shit. As a side hoe, I ain't ruining my finances for some dickwad loser. We are talking about healthy relationships today. Technique nine, meet their unmet needs. They fell for you for a reason. It's pretty simple to find out why. Then apply that to their life. Do it consciously. It's why they fell in love with you. If you don't, they will seek it out in someone else. If they like your sexiness, be sexy. If they like your healthy eating, eat healthy with them. If they like your excitement, get excited with them. Don't bait and switch. No one likes that. Bait and switch is manipulative, rude, and hard to get over. If you're throwing out sex like bread at a duck pond, you are bait and switching. No one can keep up that level of entertainment if it isn't genuine. If you give a girl sweet romantic attention the first month to hook her when you are a schizoid recluse, you are going to regret it when you can't keep it up naturally. Technique 10. Effort. Just do it. Vulnerable people appreciate effort. Normal people appreciate effort. Human beings appreciate effort. So put a little in. It's okay to love and respect someone you're angry with. It's normal to get annoyed with someone you're living with. It's okay to love and respect someone you're annoyed with. Practicing loving behavior feels good to the other person. When things are not right, things need more focus and attention. Longer than 10 minutes. Longer than one day. People brush their teeth every day to maintain healthy teeth. People eat healthy every day to maintain health. People in healthy relationships pay attention to their partner every day. 
When you ignore your teeth for 24 hours, you get a yucky buildup. When you eat bad things 24 hours straight, you get a yucky buildup. When you ignore your partner for 24 hours, you get a yucky buildup. Mental health issues crop up in unhealthy relationships. We can help each other with pre-existing mental health issues by being kind and helpful to each other. If I lean on her, I should let her lean on me so we are both stable. Technique 11. Association. Make sure they equate you with positive feelings. The more positive someone thinks of you, the better they perceive you. It doesn't matter what we are. We all have negative qualities. It's about what they perceive. So stop being a selfish, self-centered dick and be positive. Amazingly, they will associate you with positive feelings and will want to be around you. Technique 12. Be known. We all have anxiety about the unknown. Give them your schedule. No need to go overboard with an hour-by-hour play, but think about it. When we are in love, our brains want to know where the extension of our love is. What are your plans for the week? Let them know. What is your plan for the day? Let them know. Prefer privacy? Fine, but they will feel anxiety simply by not knowing where you are or what you're doing. Duh, they love you. So enjoy the fact that you just left a negative impact on their psyche for the sake of privacy or laziness. I can't imagine my husband not letting me know where he was or what he's doing. Sometimes I'm probably a little annoying and I'm like, where are you? What are you doing? He's like, I'm at this place where I already told you I was going to (laughs) be. Yeah, my happiest relationships, I knew where the other person was. And the most paranoid ones, these people would not fucking tell me what they were doing that day or that week. Technique 13. Favors. After things are established, it's time to ask for a favor. People like to help the ones they love. It makes them feel important. Let him or her do things for you. Don't be so strong you become an independent, feminist, macho asshole. How are they supposed to feel needed if you don't ever need them? We only do favors for people we like. Experiments have been done with a goal in mind to get a prospective customer to do a salesperson a small, unrelated favor. For example, if the salesperson asks a customer to hold his or her coffee cup for a brief moment, research shows we like people more after having done them a small favor. And most importantly, if they're not willing to do you a favor, they're not that into you. You basically mean nothing to them. If you do all these techniques on a surface level, that ain't love. You gotta go deep. Genuine rapport is hard to fake with women because women are better at noticing if you're not paying attention. Men are either less skilled at this or think it's normal to not connect when interacting, or it's true that they're not that into you and fake most interactions with women to get laid. If you're thinking about something other than what she's doing or saying, she's gonna notice. If you're going for genuine, you kinda have to put both feet in. Let's get sidetracked for a moment and talk about chemicals. What chemicals are you needing to elicit from your target? What is the best way to achieve the chemicals needed to support adoration, commitment, and long-term love? Phenolethamine. It is released when you gaze lovingly into someone's eyes. Phenolethamine increases a chemical in the brain called serotonin. But don't run out looking to purchase phenylethamine. Taking phenylethamine might increase serotonin too much, especially if you are taking medication that are adjusting your levels of serotonin. This could cause side effects like headaches, heart problems, shivering, confusion, and anxiety. Since it is created naturally, we recommend gazing lovingly into someone's eyes. Like me, you can gaze lovingly into my eyes. I love that shit. (laughs) Studies have been done on couples who feel passion for each other. High levels of phenylethamine were found in both partners. Teresa Crenshaw calls phenylethamine the love molecule. Crenshaw says phenylethamine is the chemical reaction behind love at first sight. She wrote the book The Alchemy of Love and Lust, How Our Sex Hormones Influence Our Relationships. She doesn't know how sight can cause this response or how it is processed through the body or brain, but she knows experiments involving couples 
gazing lovingly into each other's eyes causes a circulatory surge of phenylethylamine. Pair that with intimate questions while you get to know each other and bam, love done happen. Testosterone and estrogen are the stuff behind lust. Raw dog lust. If you keep sexual interactions abrupt, brief, or selfish, then you are missing out on cocktails nature has set aside for deeper and more meaningful interactions. The mixture of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin create attraction, which is a different feeling of need than horny. If you are lucky enough to experience the mixture of oxytocin and vasopressin, then you know what attachment feels like. Vasopressin is associated with physical and emotional vigilance and behaviors needed for guarding a partner or territory. This attachment comes with long-term love. If you've been in a relationship for four or more years, then you've experienced dopamine levels dropping off and attraction levels going down. This is a crossroads of sorts. Either you break up, limp along miserable, or that dopamine gets replaced by two hormones, oxytocin and vasopressin. These create the desire to bond with your partner and nurture them long term. How can we make sure these chemicals are flowing? Not only do you need a healthy relationship, it helps if your physical body is healthy and it helps if your mental state is healthy. What are some things we can do to help all of this along? Touch. A massage therapist is trained to not break contact, to establish trust from a client. So the client always knows where the therapist is and what's going on. People feel trust when contact is maintained. Certain touch receptors exist solely to convey emotion to the brain rather than the sensory information about the external environment. Participants in an experiment involving touch and physical contact reported feeling less neglect and less loneliness if they were in a relationship. Researchers speculate the availability of physical contact in a marriage, family, or relationship helps alleviate the stressor. Participants in relationships following the touch protocol showed a faster reduction in heart rate, Kayla, have you ever gone to a cuddle party? A what now? In LA after my divorce, I was desperate for the kind of touch you get in a marriage or a long-term relationship. Tinder was killing me with all of these lying assholes looking for booty calls. It's called Tinder for a reason. Just because all the lonely people in the world want it to be a dating app doesn't make it a dating app. Really? Because I'm pretty sure that's exactly what happened to Tinder. All the lonely people flooded onto Tinder, changing the basis of what is actually available there now. So a cuddle party. I would go to these gatherings. There would be 20 to 50 people. Somebody would host it at their house and we would line the floor with pillows and blankets. It was a giant ass cuddle party. Everyone snuggled up tight and had soft, quiet conversations. I would fall asleep like lots of people would fall asleep. Are you telling me men would not get a boner in the middle of all that? No, they did. But there was a debriefing before the start of each party explaining the safe zone that we were creating. And that included knowing that men get boners and can't help it. So men were told, you know, just like don't rub on people. And women were told this was a respectful space. If you didn't want to get a boner pressing up against you, then you cuddled with women or you were the big spoon. It was actually very pleasant and it was a safe atmosphere. That does sound nice, actually. Points out how women set the mood for appropriate touch levels. In all interactions involving sexual attraction, it is important to be sensitive to the subtle signs a woman is giving you. If she says, you just went a little too far, it's important to back off to her level. Assess if there is a genuine attraction. If there is, then it's okay and encouraged to escalate touch later. All she is saying in the moment is not yet. If you're ignoring any of these steps, a girl doesn't trust you. You haven't built enough comfort, intimacy, or gotten to know her very well. If you're having sex with her, it's not likely she's going to orgasm. If she is, you found someone able to get off with minimal connection, and hey, that's a good thing for you. That's up to the two of you, but be aware, there is a very high percentage of women out there who fake orgasms just like you fake romance. What if all these steps and techniques sound like too much to remember? 
set an alarm or Jesus Christ use the million apps that auto send. We're talking about simple things that help a person feel seen and desired. So they feel like this is real and not fake, wishy-washy, random, and only when you're horny. If you are not a touchy person, but you know she likes to be hugged, then set your alarm to hug her. Set it to remind yourself to kiss her forehead. Once each day, pause and look into her eyes. Tell her how pretty she is. Do it every day. What's it going to hurt you? How much time do these things take? A total of eight seconds each? I mean, Jesus, just do it. Don't be a dick. Tell them what you need. We all get tired, confused, misread things, misinterpret stuff, and we all forget what we are told to do. So be open to repeating yourself. Don't make them read your mind. It's not fun. People's relationships are rife with problems stemming from conditioning mistakes. These are the three biggest. Punishing someone for no or unknown reasons. Don't punish your love interest for no reason. Don't get moody, pissy, or distant because he didn't read your mind. Another one is rewarding bad behaviors. Do not encourage bad behavior. If he isn't freely giving you the steps above and you rush to make him happy, then you just taught him to treat you like shit. If he isn't treating you right, do not be nice to him to prove you deserve love. He is an asshole. Go find a nice person to give your love to. Another one is withholding rewards. Do not withhold rewards. Reward the behaviors you want repeated when you feel gratitude. Tell them you feel gratitude. Open your mouth. Speak so they can hear you. Absorb and reflect back gratefulness. If you enjoy the good morning texts that she's sending you each morning, but then you take seven hours to respond, you are actively discouraging her to text you good morning at all. Remember, have respect. Listen, appreciate, approve, excite, nurture admire, trust, coexist responsibly. Emphasize what you want. Emphasize what you can do. Men want to feel competent, loved, needed, and respected. And women want to feel nurtured, treasured, heard, and reassured. Men can feel lonely, hurt, scared, angry, worried, disappointed, let down, sad, attacked, misunderstood, used, ashamed, dumb, trapped, guilty, frustrated, incompetent, confused, or jealous. Women can feel abandoned, taken advantage of, obsessive. They feel a need to nag. They feel unheard, ignored, like a cum hole dumpster box instead of a supported, loved human being. We are going to take a commercial break. We'll be right back. And we're back. Dopamine, testosterone, oxytocin, norepinephrine, and phenylethamine all work together to create a biochemical feedback loop of love. In women, sexual pleasure and romantic attachment release the entire bundle of chemicals, but not so in men. That is why they can have sex and not care. To get a man to feel anything, it requires prolonged eye contact. To get all five chemicals flowing in a man, you must take the full approach outlined above. Women are easy. A little love, a little touch, a little care. Done. Men are more difficult. Beware you don't rely on a chemical release. Love is a function of personal history, preferences, and current behavior. Figure out what makes her feel loved. Write it down if you have to and set alarms to deliver if you have to. The effort you put in today is the same effort she wants tomorrow and next year. It's not that difficult to look genuinely happy to see someone once each day. And what is the end result you're seeking? Will the reaction you're giving right now give you that end result? Relationships are not tit-for-tat situations. But how do you know you are not taking advantage of someone if you never bother looking at your own behavior? Add it up. Check to see. Every breath she takes for you, are you reciprocating? If not, 
I suggest you step up your game. They call it 50-50 for a reason. If you're a clueless John boy, then sit down with her and ask her for a list of everything she does for you and what she contributes to the relationship. If you need to, ask her for a list of things you could contribute. She might have some great ideas, things she's hoping you will fulfill. If you're a forgetful person, you can have an account pre-set up at a floral shop to deliver flowers on all the days. Mother's Day, birthdays, Valentine's Day. Think before you react. The other person is a human being with their own inherent worth and dignity. When they disappoint you, Make reasonable and positive excuses for the behavior. Don't attack them just because your feelings got hurt. They cannot read your mind and they had a shitty day. So be supportive or quit pretending you want real love. I would like to introduce next week's episode, episode 21, Sucrose sugaring. I am going to interview Rachel about being a sugar baby. I have held back all my questions. It is time to open up and ask her. This will definitely be a trigger warning episode. We are all familiar with how disgusting she can be. And this will be a no holds bar conversation about her sugaring adventures. More than likely, it will induce a few gag reflexes and traumatic shudders in everyone listening, maybe even in me asking. I personally will be having a glass of wine so it rolls off my back. And maybe I don't remember everything she says because who needs those kinds of thoughts running through your mind, right? We want you guys to submit your ideas, stories, and questions pertaining to next week's episode. You can email us or join us on Patreon. We want to hear from you. And if you got anything out of today's episode, give us some love. Subscribe and rate us. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We love you. See you next week on Dating Hypothesis. Dating Hypothesis.